Welcome everyone. Welcome to Edina. Yeah, Edina is a unique media platform which tries to aggregate community voices. So what we are trying to do here is get community to speak and also use the community to reach out to people about news and information. So in this process, we also are looking to interview people and bring those ideas back to the community for uh, discussions. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Anand Tentumbe uh, today. And it's a great pleasure uh, to have someone like him who is a scholar, who is a writer, civil rights activist. And his books have contributed greatly to both the literature and the process of activism and discussion and debates around it. Uh, I think uh, it will be a great opportunity for us to understand what what he thinks is the trajectory we are leading towards as we enter into uh, a few months from the election. So first and foremost, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank there. you so much. A pleasure to be here. Uh, before uh, we start into getting into the politics and the academic framework, would I've always wanted to know uh, that what made you leave the corporate world? And I, I will follow up the other question too. The academics and activism seem synonymous in your case. Uh, how does that work for you and how does one feed into the other or, or are they similar or the same? This activism has run parallel in my career. So right from the student days, we were some way or the other. You know, we were born when Ambedkarite movement in our area was uh, quite happening. <clears throat> so something like the people had converted and it was quite live movement out there. Uh, my place actually happens to be in Vidarbha and uh, district Yavat Mahal, but which is very, that is actually in proximity of Nagpur. So that, that used to be very stronghold of Ambedkarite politics. So we were somewhere born into it. Uh, so all these meetings etc. used to happen, so we used to be part of it. But the problem is that uh, there was nothing to formally read about Ambedkar or the movement. It was just the folklore, you know, that people used to speak and half-literate people uh, gossip around and so it, it, it was more confusing than otherwise. Uh, so, <coughs> and moreover, my village was not such. It was something like a very cosmo village. We actually lived in older part of it and the newer part actually formed around the coal mines. There was a railway station right from British times to haul coal to uh, up <coughs> the industries. Then there were dolomite mines and so many mines, many minerally very rich area. So as a result, that part of thing became very cosmopolitan. All kinds of people, right from you name it, and we had it. <laughs> so that kind of atmosphere, I uh, <coughs> grew in. Uh, about academics, all right, uh, again it, it is something we did not know what to mm, learn, what to this thing. I happen to be quite good in studies and there were not many teachers, etc. So I, I was almost topper. So and flowed in current, you know, right from that the school <coughs> days, the toppers actually emptied out in a high school which was used to be very reputed then. They were the only first standard, I mean, first uh, rankers or second rankers people they admitted. So I landed up there. Again, <coughs> a higher level of activism, like confronting things. Uh, I never spoke about it, but this Anand of Navayanas forced me to speak about <laughs> some incident. So to relate to the book, then I told him on telephone what happened in my, when I was ninth standard. So there used to be RSS people, you know, Brahmin boys used to come with that RSS cap, black cap. And school uniform, however, was white cap. So, and they were allowed. So it was taken for granted that this, it's, that's the thing, that's the way it is, you know, until you challenge, people will take it for granted. So we thought to challenge it. And that time I used to sort of do painting, etc., and get money. So we had spare money. So I said, okay. So we bought a lot of uh, this blue caps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> blue caps and distributed to people. We had a lot of weight in the school, this thing. Even I had a following among all the students. So 
So even the Brahmin students also Good. not knowing, those not wearing black caps, because they were elite kind of RSS families, mm -hmm. they only wore. So they were at uh, 20 odd or maybe 30 odd kind of people who wore. But the rest of the Brahmins also did not wear. They mm -hmm. abided by the white cap. Mm -hmm. So even those people also took it. Mm -hmm. We said uh, on a particular day you have to come in blue caps. <laughs> so, so it happened like, so on a particular day then suddenly in the prayer they find that all people are in blue caps. The prayer happened but then all those people who were in blue caps uh, were asked to stay on. So we stayed on. Then the, it Interestingly, the PT <coughs> master, who hap the, the, he happened to be Dalit, mm. Mm. and <coughs> who actually managed these kinds of things, and he came to us and asked, "Why? What is this?" And all. And he started blurting out. So I said, uh, <coughs> "He came to me. He knew me anyway. I was a bit respected one. <laughs> so I had a, my classmate who was bodyguard." So he he so kind of uh, enraged. I said something. So he raised, he raised his hand. He caught his hand up mm -hmm. <laughs> in the air itself. So he he was very strong boy. So he, then then he took us to headmaster. Headmaster happened to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then I was I kind of smiled at him and said that what is this <laughs> you are doing? So I said okay, this is very simple. Mm. This is uniform and it is your work that we are carrying out. This is you had to do these things. You make people wear uniform, that's it. It's a simple matter. So then he asked all people to go away. But initially anyway, the thread master do, he threatened me and all, rustication etc. Do whatever you want, I said. But this is a very simple matter. Do your duty first and then talk to me. Mm. Mm. And uh, then he casual with me something like they are very big people, etc. Give me some more time, I will try to talk to them. I said that's nothing, it's very simple. Until they wear a white cap, this will continue. Wow. It was something like Friday, I think. And it so happened Saturday, <coughs> this uh, half day school. And then came Monday. Monday, automatically these people were in white caps. So okay. we also <laughs> we also kept our caps in pocket <laughs> and went to school. So it died down like there was nothing big a big thing. So that's what appeared in Rep Republic of Caste. Hmm. Apart from that, the small small episodes, you know, like in any elite school also, although it is rank hold a school kind of thing, but there will always be bottom. And bottom would be invariably constituted by Dalits. Mm. So those kind of things, meaning that school had a different kind of uh, institutionalized uh, practices, like uh, <coughs> uh, good students used to be team leaders, and there were small teams formed in a class. So what that leader would do is that all assignments, etc., he would check and do that. So one of the biggest uh, team, I was the leader. So I used to check, the all newcomers actually were attached to me. So this was, and most of the people who came from outside, they did not do, relatively speaking, academically well. So then we used to do classes, etc. Uh, <coughs> privately, then there was a scholarship for Delhi students, no? So that struggle comes to my mind that we waged and won. So, so we used to be quite popular. But in nutshell, what I what I'm saying is that the activism went parallel, very unconsciously. Nothing <laughs> yes, big about it. Came to college and college thereafter you grew anyway. So I firstly wanted to read about Ambedkar. That's the first time in Nagpur I found something in print about Ambedkar. So university library has to go with a notebook and dictionary and studied Ambedkar like that. And alongside, by that time actually I had uh, interface with, that happened in uh, my village itself. Uh, we used to get uh, book in 
prize, you know, for standing first, etc. Mm -hmm. So I had got a, I don't know, it was unintended, but uh, <coughs> Stalin's biography. Okay. So whatever question that were in my mind, no, the, why our house is not there? We, we were um, on one of the poorest of poor. I don't want to talk oh. about my <laughs> parent family. The people just say, but we were poorest. We did not have any assets. So naturally, that why we don't owe <coughs> uh, goats, why do not, why do we don't have bullocks, why do we do not have cows, why do we do not have land? Mm. Such simple question, childish question, and there were no answers from my mother. Mm. She said, "Okay, <laughs> you when you grow, you get all that. What we do not have today." But this Stalin's book, the small book, opened up this horizon. Hmm. So I thought that these are the answers. So I lingered on and I went on reading a lot about whatever that was available on uh, socialism or Russian revolution and things like. So there was innate de uh, develop, meaning interest developed about those people who talk this language like later came Bhagat Singh, so I held him in high esteem. So this, this was a natural flow, there was nothing. Nothing unnatural, nothing break, you were always somewhere dissenting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it goes to my next one, which I would like you to help us with. It's, it seems like there is a lot of dissent, there is understanding of Ambedkar in through a folklore kind of a thing. Then you go searching, but in the meantime you read Stalin, so there is some Marxism flowing in. And you've been unique in that sense uh, of bringing these two frameworks and saying there's a lot of synergy between the two. Uh, would you take some time to explain to us how the social inequality, and one probably talks about a little bit about economic inequality, how they are interlinked, especially in Indian framework. Uh, can you spend a little bit of time explaining to us that framework and then we can go to Indian politics after that. Uh, I would answer it in that, this way, actually what comes is a fundamental. <coughs> so it's a tussle between, a tussle to find out the basics. So all that Marxism is re reduced to is a materialism. Hmm. Leave apart dialectical materialism or anything, any complication, it's a materialism. And re rest, of the, rest of it, something like a social equality that caste equality, gender equality or whatever that has, uh, that is extent, that we confront. But it is important to understand the, the roots of it. Mm. And I think in my <coughs> limited way, I find that it all emanates from the economic inequality. These are different kinds of manifestation or they institutionalized in course of time that get, got institutionalized in a different forms and uh, it came to be that. So, for instance, uh, if people had uh, <coughs> wherewithals, imagine an extremity, I used to imagine, I will t say in the same language that if we had owned the lime factory, my parents owned the lime factory. Will anybody dare to discriminate against us? Incidentally, I was not so much discriminated. I did not have much of a caste experience, I should confess. But I imagine that will anybody dare to do that? No. My, my answer is no from my side. People would say that even if it is rich and still they would, <coughs> the caste would not go that kind of thing uh, probably I do not so much subscribe to. So, <coughs> they, they, as a inertia, you know, so social inertia, they may do, try to do that, okay, fall back. After all, he is a Dalit, he is untouchable or some such thing. Uh, they, there would be tendency to do that, but materially he cannot dent to me. So, this way I developed my understanding that this is what it is, that our people do not have anything, they do not have land. They do not have wherewithals to live independently. They are dependent upon the agriculture. And because of that, there is this thing actually go on. They can, they can manipulate you. They can call, uh, call you names. They can abuse you. They can exploit you and all kind. Uh, incidentally, my village was not a 
classical village that all these things would actually be seen in very prominent way. We had, as I said initially, the, it was an adjunct of the <coughs> industrialized part of the village. So, most of Dalits also actually worked on factories, coal mines, are in, coal mine was closed down before I was born. But all that industrial kind of interface was there. So, because of that, the, the, most of people actually lived on uh, uh, the earnings of, of the factory and was not dependent upon this uh, <coughs> dependence on agriculture, etc. became a side activity. During season, etc., people used to go, even my parents did. So, <coughs> ultimately, we were dependent. That dependence actually defined the relationship. Mm, and that actually provided the motive force for this social uh, kinds of uh, processes to be carried on. So, this, this, was, this was my understanding. To what extent it was right, I do not know. But later on, I found, found me more right than more, yeah. wrong. So, <laughs> some people do argue that even if the economic equality is there, until we see, like they usually point out the marriage place where people are so caste centric, they wouldn't move. Then does does this also emanate from somewhere the economic inequality? How does it matter? Because Samas, similar folks would actually come together anyway. Take an, another example of Parsis. They came from different land. They uh, ghettoized themselves. They marry with, uh, within themselves, etc. But do they suffer anything? Yeah, so socially, it doesn't it? It really doesn't matter. If somebody calls me an idiot, it's okay. I'm an idiot, but I'm living better than you. So how 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 would you persist calling me an idiot? Because it doesn't match with the reality, no? Okay. I'm well off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like that. Okay, I, later on I developed my understanding that these are not to be brushed away. These are the realities again of life and uh, the social institutions etc. are not that flimsy that they will die down. And it's a larger problem and how does one deal with larger problem? It's okay, there could be simultaneous uh, struggle against it, a very conscious struggle against even for instance caste system. Uh, other things I will leave apart because gender also is in the same category. Uh, so, <clears throat> so there has to be conscious struggle. So, and I mm, kind of started faulting the communists uh, for their borrowed understanding uh, to, uh, <coughs> to look at the Indian reality. And that way, I start, uh, sort of started writing also. Yeah, actually, it takes me uh, very well to the next point. You, you've been a champion of saying that there is a lot to learn from the Marxist movement and the ideas. Uh, some of that has been the criticism of the communist movement. Uh, where, how do you look at that movement till the right wing took over? There's some sort of uh, people think that that movement has not taken from each other and the two have gone independently or one has not imagined the other. How would you like, I mean, it's a very long history. The communist movement and the Dalit movement may not have taken or shared views on themselves. Yeah. I may be wrong about that itself, but th that's a common feeling. Yeah. Do you think that's right? Or do you think that there is, it has not yielded results from learning from each other? Yeah. That's a very unfortunate thing to have happened in this uh, country. Otherwise, probably, I, I <clears throat> uh, ventured to say that if this had happened, probably India was the candidate for revolution long, long back. Mm. <clears throat> so, this is very unfortunate. Uh, they, I find there is something like an uh, uh, innate instinct in Indians to copy. There is no originality. <laughs> so, the upper caste who actually became early communists also wanted a ready-made model. Even today they speak of the same thing. When you discuss, they, they, they do not confront the reality from the, uh, of the basics. They do not talk about basics. They will, if this is not, then which model we should follow? Mm. So, this model and this uh, um, uh, kind of uh, earlier examples, etc. have <coughs> guided them. So, it is absolutely idiotic uh, to 
kind of uh, deal with Indian situation. Uh, <clears throat> in a way, Indian situation was a unique because of the caste system, and they needed to confront this, and they utterly failed. Came the Dalit movement, Dalit movement with Ambedkar uh, uh, emerging as a big uh, leader. They all, he also sh ought to share the uh, blame. Okay. So, this kind of thing I have written in that introduction, which then blaming Dalit movement as well as balancing out in a way. But Ambedkar <coughs> share, uh, uh, ought to be blamed a little lesser, because he did not have a formal kind of uh, <coughs> uh, belief in the a priori kind of system, uh, principles, etcetera, because he was so much influenced, deeply influenced about by pragmatism, uh, instrumentalism, etcetera, of John Dewey, uh, which he acknowledges in when he was in 1952, you know, when he was himself a great man. <laughs> so, you can think of, and this is, there is a vast literature now coming out that how much influ influence Ambedkar carried of John Dewey. So, something like an extrapolation in his important text like uh, annihilation of caste and right up to Buddhism, the end of it, uh, even some, someone like Mirananda etc. would call it a Divian Buddhism, that is not Buddhism, that it does not have, even Ambedkar would concede that it is not a classical Buddhism, he did not want to adhere to that, but this is what. So, in Ambedkar's case, to expect that uh, uh, this kind of understanding of the world, uh, what I mean is the in terms of material thing or something like an historical materialism, etc., was not uh, <coughs> done. He did not have those kinds of beliefs. So, as a result, he went in a pragmatic way. He wanted to, the, his basic motive that he started of movement with was to ameliorate Dalits. Okay, and <coughs> it comes to uh, when he started sort of gathering people. The people were all working class, we, which were halfway through the in the communist movement. So he had a challenge, organizational challenge, to keep his folks away from this communism. It was a it was a big attraction to the people, you know. Hmm. So actually. Uh, this was the uh, organizational imperative that he wanted to keep the uh, the list away from communism, and then started sort of finding faults with his theory uh, that is the patterning of pigs kind of theory. The economic is not the entire thing. There is social thing. There is an element of truth in whatever he said, <coughs> but that was not the communism at all. Once he said that he had read. Uh, more books than all communists together. Uh, all this was rhetoric. Ambedkar was a big writer, and uh, all this can be taken as a rhetoric. You know, uh, actually, the people who researched into his library, his uh, things, etc., they did not they did not find any com books on communism, classics, etc. And all that he spoke about was a practical thing, like what happened in Russia, what happened somewhere, or all that. So. In nutshell, what I'm saying is that it was more of a blame to the communists who did fail to understand the reality of the land and depended upon the borrowed theories, models, etc. Because they potentially were equipped with the very advanced kind of theory. So now the task was to just <coughs> apply it properly to the situation obtaining on uh, on the ground. Hmm. There is one thing I wanted to ask, like is you did talk about how the Indian communists did not think and some of the leaders were from the upper caste themselves. Is Was it a lack of imagination or would we have seen something else uh, if the leadership came from ground up from Dalits within those movements, would we have some, seen something different? Because they did speak about the land being an important thing, but it somehow it did not seem to take off in the same. It is not that uh, the Dalits were not in the communist movement, there were quite a lot of communist movement, you know, a very uh, couple of times only crop up, uh, but there were 
a lot of people who were in a formal communist uh, organization, but Dalits would always be subordinated. You know, there was something like a hegemonic hold of the upper caste. So the thero the theoretician, one guy uh, gave this thing, no theoretic, something like Bra theoretician Brahmin versus. Uh, Pragmatic Dalit or something like that. Brahmins should educated people, you know, English speaking people, etc. They would assume that they know theory better. Hmm. Hmm. Even in our times also, when we were in the movement, we were left left oriented movement, so it was taken for granted. That, that brings me to the question here. We're talking about lack of maybe imagination and leadership. Uh, the right wing, headed by the RSS in some sense, has managed to. Uh, constantly rethink itself in some sense uh, and I feel in the recent past when I was young uh, I used to keep hearing that their Govindachari has been given to do a new constitution of Hindu uh, etc. I don't know whether it's true or not so but rumors used to come around but now it looks like they are pretty clear that they, within this uh, and that's what I feel and you could correct that they are going to use the Indian constitution manipulate it in such a way or present it in such a way that it's a reinterpretation of some Hindu text and it might even reflect Manu Smriti in some, sign, some, some time mm -hmm. and that would be a very disastrous position to look at but it looks like that's where they're going. They're really imagining the Indian constitution law itself into a place where we could see Manu Smriti in it and that's very strange. Uh, do you think that's what is happening or is there another way to look at it and would you be able to spend some time explaining us what RSS is doing to us, the constitution itself, the, the laws of the country and the institutions. What's your take on it? Our constitution again needs to be understood, right? Uh, our constitution is a <coughs> contrivance to manage the statecraft. Mm. And because of that, they, uh, it actually took most of it from India Act 1935, the last British constitution. These are all documented facts. Now, what are, what are other things that uh, rest of it that it added? Uh, it borrowed something like uh, from Irish constitution and uh, made it into chapter 4, directive principles. The chapter 3, which actually contain the fundamental rights, probably is the very distinguishing part of a constitution that one could be proud of. But <coughs> if you minutely look at it, uh, all our fundamental uh, rights have a leak hmm, in favor of state. Okay. The explanation, uh, this issue was raised in the um, constituent assembly. And Ambedkar's explanation, because he was dealing with all this kind of thing, piloting his draft. So, his explanation was, yeah, I concede, meaning some people said that American constitution has the absolute right, fundamental rights ought to be absolute. And he conceded American constitution has the absolute right, but when it went to Supreme Court, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that state does not <coughs> However, absolute, the state does not um, rule uh, or lose out its police power, quote unquote. And he explained that instead of leaving it to judiciary, we ourselves actually <coughs> uh, <laughs> uh, provided the escape route for the state. Should state be needing it, the state can uh, use its police power and it is incorporated into the constitution. Now, both the things are not equivalent, but we will we'll leave that part. <laughs> okay, there are a lot of co problematics in constitution as it stands, but that is not, that is a lengthy issue. So, <coughs> that is it. So, it cannot be conflated with Manusruti because and I, I do not think it sounded strange to me that somebody is interpreting it in Manusruti way. Uh, what they would do tomorrow? is different things. Uh, I do not subscribe to again that the constitution would be changed. No, we probably cannot be, it cannot be rewritten, no, which is actually beneficial to the ruling classes. Hmm. So, <coughs> so what they would do is they, be, they would tinker probably to the basic structure that would bring it in something like a presidential <coughs> presidential form of government, a man, one man would rule a 
prototype is given by RSS and kind of like there would be a uh, Rajya Sabha is there in place of that there might be something like uh, <coughs> advisory body comprising sadhu sant and some of their intellectuals you know seers and philosophers and then then follow this uh, rest of it it, it doesn't harm them and uh, probably they do away with or rather supplement with the uh, chapter of uh, fundamental duties alongside the uh, rights because nothing now uh, particularly talking about uh, this decade past <coughs> 2000 post 2014 there is hardly any meaning to fundamental rights okay so they have been um, uh, sort of we <coughs> almost non-existent you know the the police power has overwhelmed everything mm. in the constitution so so what they would deal with uh, it's like that when when people apprehend about manuspriti etc i personally don't think that manuspriti can be recreated whatever that has happened today is actually what is the essence of the manuspriti manuspriti actually valorized the Mm, graded inequality mm. that and that is where the Brahminic system has been. So that graded inequality already is extinct. So there is nothing much to be done. Now they, that need not be uh, uh, confined to the labels that somebody is really born and Dali so he should mm. be uh, low only. Problem is that if he is in tune of powers that be and is helpful, profitable to them. Uh, that he could they they can uh, cope him but largely speaking the society would be those people who have fallen behind and have not come up the uh, mid, uh, low, lower middle class downwards which constitute the majority of them their fate is sealed so those people would be you now the, the with technology and the econo uh, the world economy the paradigm is being created that okay so long as we can feed them because you, if you take a, a <coughs> uh, something like or the uh, analog kind of calculations also would support that it doesn't need much resources to sustain them as pigs you know so long as they do not create a disturbance uh, let them leave we will support them so they as as the government is actually um, providing them ration for something like 80 crores of people hmm, it <coughs> so that is in the same nature, no? Correct. So it doesn't cost. And say, say another paradigm that is emerging is something philanthropy. You amass a wealth of trillions of dollars, and the uh, fellow gives it. Okay, two point nine um, trillion is uh, given to philanthropy. But who is in control? What does he? What do you understand? You know, all these rich guys, you know, that trend is coming. People have been donating money. But the control remains with them. The problem is with that, no? Okay. Yeah, that's that's a very way, interesting, good way to for us to imagine. I feel sometimes we are not imagining well enough how things will unfold. Yeah, yeah. So it's a notion of see. Ultimately, now something like Elon Musk uh, having two hundred billion dollars or something like. So what does it mean? Because what does what does money mean to him? It's a sense of power. And the sense of Modi, Modi for instance might not be having any asset in his name, but that doesn't mean anything. He is controlling the 1.4 billion people and their destiny. That's what it is. So ultimately it is a sense of power that uh, would prevail again. So the economic thing also need not be inter interpreted in such a superfluous manner. So it's ultimately what prevails is the uh, help the authority or the world that's it yeah uh, thank you team uh, for uh, for telecasting it and also for all the people who are watching edina edina is a platform is an independent platform which likes to bring uh, people together and communities together and discuss important issues we also support all the other independent media houses because that's the call these days we need to support the independent uh, media houses because that's perhaps keeping live the news uh, and the views and the dissent of, of people. So thank you again.
ಮತ್ತಷ್ಟು ವಿಶೇಷ ವಿಡಿಯೋಗಳನ್ನು ನೋಡಲು ಮತ್ತು ಹೊಸ ವಿಡಿಯೋಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ತಿಳಿಯಲು ಈ ದಿನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಚಾನೆಲ್ ಸಬ್ಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್